On this week's episode of Hear These Words, it's Christ the King Sunday. It is the last Sunday of the church year, and we get David's last words. We get a picture from Revelation of God's, Christ's uh, kingship, and we get Pilate questioning Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Join us for this week's Hear These Words. Welcome to Hear These Words, a podcast and video series from Good Shepherd Episcopal Church in beautiful Tequesta, Florida. I'm Sanford Groff. I am the rector here, and it is great to see you. Every week on the podcast, we look ahead at the readings that have been assigned for the Sunday coming up. And the words we hear for this upcoming Sunday are for Christ the King, proper 29B as in boy. And it is the last Sunday of the church year. The words we hear are 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 through 7, portions of Psalm 132, Revelation chapter 1, verses 4b through 8, and the Gospel of John chapter 18, verses 33 through 37. It is the last Sunday of the church year. We begin a new, count, a new church year on Advent 1, which is the following Sunday. And Christ the King Sunday is um, something that is uh, a little a little different in the Episcopal Church. The, it's the last Sunday after Pentecost. Christ the King Sunday started really in the Roman Catholic Church after World War One in 1925. Uh, 1926 was the first observation of it after the Pope said that this was going to be Christ the King Sunday, and it really reoriented the church to recognize and to celebrate Christ's kingship, Christ's um, uh, kind of sovereignty over the universe. Uh, in, the, in the heels of uh, uh, European kind of nationalism and European um, kind of self, uh, kind of self aggrandizement uh, of the, of the early 20th century. And so it, it served as a bit of a corrective for what was happening in Europe at the time. And now, 100 years later, here we are, uh, you know, still still celebrating Christ the King. And of course, it is a, it is a um, kind of a timeless truth, right? Christ being the King of the universe is not something that is particular to any particular time. And yet, the way we might look at that or interpret that might might change or we might have a different perspective based upon our own time right we're not we're not in 1920 25 1926 so uh on this coming up on the 100th anniversary of the you know change in the liturgical calendar to include Christ the king uh, we will celebrate that here at good shepherd and um and and, and it's uh uh, you know, I think there there are different opinions within the Episcopal Church about about what you what you do on this day, but um, for us, it's Christ the King. So uh, we have we start off with Second Samuel here, and it, these recount the last words of David. These are kind of a poetic reflection on David's own kingship under God's promise, under God's covenant, and. Um, you know, he, uh, uh, he, he, he says that this time under which he has served as king under God's governance has been like, uh, like the dawn and, and, and full of a, a fruitful time. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the themes here, though, um, the themes here, though, are you know, covenantal leadership, which is which is a leadership based in God's promises to us, and it also it also highlights God's justice. So David contrasts this you know covenantal leadership with 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 the wicked, right? Um, and uh, yeah, he he contrasts this with the wicked, and um, 
You know, the godless are like thorns that are thrown away, for they cannot be picked up with the hand. To touch them, one uses an iron bar or the shaft of a spear, and they are entirely consumed in fire on the spot. So he paints this kind of picture uh, of, of righteousness versus wickedness. Um, but, but again, here we have, I think, the lectionary writers attempting to foreshadow Christ's own rule, trying to show how <clears throat> Christ is not, not just in the lineage and line of David, but in fact is the perfection of David's kingship, uh, where David fell short, as we've talked about on this podcast many months ago. Uh, here we have, you know, David kind of reflecting and yet also, uh, you know, preparing for the everlasting covenant that has been made with his lineage. And so, um, you know, as we, as we transition into Advent and as we celebrate Christ the King, it does remind us of the anticipation that we will have for Christ, uh, both in his birth in the manger and for his second coming uh, at the end of time, and how Jesus will fulfill fulfill God's covenant with David, that this promise that God has made um, uh, through David. So I think it's, a, I think it's a, a good kind of way to start our, our reflection and start our celebration of Christ the King. <clears throat> our Psalm, you know, portions of Psalm 132, I'm going to let you take a look on that, look at that on your own. Um, but then uh, um, the Revelation passage kind of brings us into um, a little bit more of a robust image of what this looks like. And, you know, um, you know, the seven spirits who are before the throne from Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, more explicit talking about Jesus's role as Christ to the king. <clears throat> made us to be a kingdom, priests serving God, his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Look, he, he's coming in the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, right? The beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. And, you know, great kind of, again, poetic imagery, um, grandiose imagery, universal imagery. In this passage, John, the author of Revelation, greets the seven churches and declares, you know, Jesus as that faithful witness, the ruler of the kings of the earth. And this emphasis of Christ's sovereignty and his eternal kingship uh, is the focus. He is the savior of the world, but also the judge of the world. And 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 I I just um, you know, I think when we are looking at things like this, we are left in awe at the magnitude, right? At how how big this feels. And I think that's a, I think that's a fair you know I think that's a fair way of approaching the text. I think it's a you know kind of looking at how how grandiose you know look he's coming in the clouds every eye will see him. There's no missing Christ the King. There's no kind of mistaking Christ the King. But you know what 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 I think um, I'd like to pull in from last week is the disciples are having this kind of apocalyptic conversation with Jesus. And they say, what are the signs that we're going to know that the end is near? And, and Jesus says, well, there's going to be deception. There are going to be people who come in my name. There's going to be a misunderstanding, a, a misreading, and there's going to be chaos in that, in that way. Um, and, and Revelation here does not seem to admit that. Revelation makes it very clear um, what, what is going to happen. Um, but, but, I, but I think, I think, I think there's a, a little piece here that we don't want to miss. Um, and that is on his account, on Jesus's account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. All the tribes of the earth will wail. This is where I get, I get a little bit 
direct in terms of my, um, um, call it my priorities or how I identify, right? That I'm a follower of Jesus first, right? I'm a Christian first. And the temptation, the you know, it's subtle uh, in some ways, we don't even realize it's a temptation, is to align ourselves with human, with human power, right? To align ourselves with uh, particular, um, uh, you know, kind of collective, uh, even national self-interest. And to say, you know, that that is my primary marker. That's my primary allegiance. And, and I'm not saying that, you know, I think we are, I think we are a both and. It's not an either or kind of situation, especially as Episcopalians. But we need to make sure the priorities are right. Uh, we've got to be aligned We've got to be aligned with God. We've got to we've got to follow Jesus and not get tricked into collapsing that distinction with any sort of, um, you know, placing a human or or a a, a a a human interest over that divine interest. And I think this is where. <clears throat> You know, on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. Well, the tribes of the earth are going to wail because the tribes of the earth are self-interested. Because the tribes of the earth are interested in their agenda. They're interested in what they're up to. They're interested in their power and, and what they've built. And this is where, again, I go back to last week with apocalyptic language. Look at these great stones. Look at this great building, the disciples say. And Jesus basically says, yeah. It's going to be a, a heap of rubble. It's going to it's going to come. The temple is going to come crashing down, and the thing that you invested in, in in the presence of God's and and and, and Jesus's kingship, is basically going to look like a pile of rubble, and <clears> that's <throat> going to be cause for wailing. I mean, that there's going to be there's going to be cause for for distress because. There's going to be a realignment. There's going to be a, a way in which um, um, the veil uh, will be will be removed, and 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 the, the the kind of truth of the divine cosmos will be revealed. Now, I don't think that's something to be afraid of. I just I don't I don't I'm not. I don't have that. I'm an Episcopalian man. I don't. I don't have that kind of doom and gloom. Get you know, John, almost a John the Baptist kind of attitude about being prepared. I, I actually think it's far more subtle than that. I, I think Revelation is putting it in very, very, very stark terms. I actually align more with how Jesus talks with his disciples, sitting on the stoop, looking over at the at the temple. And that is that God is moving in, in the still and quiet places. God is moving in places that are far more deep and real than what, what we can kind of articulate or see with our eyes. I, I, I don't know if in our lifetime, I mean, I'm not a prognosticator, I'm not a prophet, right? But I don't know if our lifetime we're going to be seeing this the way that Revelation is you know look he's coming with the clouds right like out of out of you know that out of the clouds here comes Jesus and every eye will see him I don't read that you know, I, I mean I guess I read it literally at some point in time I don't think that time is any time in our lifetime now you might disagree with me you might say oh no oh no you've not been paying attention to the signs and they're coming and <clears throat> okay that, that's fine I might be wrong but 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 I think that, you know, I think that 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 God's glory and um, and dominion is being revealed subtly and in a way that doesn't compromise our human agency, our free will. I believe that we have a choice. I think that I think that we can choose to see this world with the eyes of faith and we can see the work of of Christ the King, we can see the power of the Holy Spirit at work in and among us, or I think we can be afraid. And I think we can, and, and I think we can worry about the, the beautiful stones and buildings that we've built. 
and um, and want our identity and our priority to be in those spaces of, of human achievement, which again, it's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying it is not the most important thing. It is not the truest thing or the most real thing. And you see this in people's lives when, when things do come crumbling down. And yet for some reason, they continue to have faith. And that faith breeds hope, um, and that hope is is lived out in love. And so, Revelation is a great image. I, I, I again, I'm not as um, I think it makes for great kind of um, hymnody and I, I, you know, almost poetry. But I'm not sure I would necessarily. I'm not. I, I'm not going to go and take my eye off of the subtle things, um, because I think that this is going to just sweep the day in my lifetime. But let me know what you think. You might feel free to disagree. We're Episcopalians here. You can disagree, please. <clears throat> All right. John chapter 18. Here we, here we fast forward a bit. And it's interesting because for Christ the King, they've They've put the, the, the conversation between Pilate and Jesus after Jesus' arrest. And so Pilate's questioning Jesus here in John. And his question, are you the king of the Jews? And, and you know, Jesus kind of doesn't answer. He gives these non-answers, right? Do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about that? And Pilate said, I, listen, I'm not, I, I, I'm not part of your, your, I'm not Jewish, am I? Um, your people have handed me over, handed you over to me. And he says, what have you done? What have you done? It's a question about behavior. What have you done, right? Pilate is looking at action. He wants to know what, what Jesus has done. And there's a question here about, you know, is Pilate asking these questions as a way of really, because he's curious? Or is it more of an indictment? Jesus says, and, and Jesus does not answer with a statement of action or behavior. He answers with a statement of identity. My kingdom is not from this world. If, the, if, my, if my kingdom were from this world, followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. But as, as it is, my kingdom is not from here. He talks about whose he is, who he belong, kind of belongs to, where he belongs um, rather than what he has done. And I think that's a very important, you know, I think that's a very important reminder on Christ the King Sunday. I, I mean, in general as well. You know, the, the disciples say, what are the signs going to be? What are the behaviors? What are the actions? The, the, the disciples almost are kind of like Pilate. They're kind of like us. Tell me what I need to be aware of. What's going to happen? And Jesus is saying, it's not about what's happening. It's about who I am. It's about where I'm from. Um, it's, about, it's about who you are in relationship to me. Where are you? You know, Jesus almost, again, he's not literally doing this. But in my mind, he's kind of turning the question on where, where's your kingdom, right? Where do you put your, where do you plant your flag in terms of, what really matters to you. Um, my kingdom is not from this world, Jesus says. Um, my kingdom, you know, uh, so Pilate says, okay, so you are a king, right? I mean, he, he, I, he's probably at this point a bit exasperated. And, and Jesus says, you say that I am king. For this I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Um, and, and, and right after this, we're going to get Pilate saying, well, what is truth, right? But, but we don't have time to get into that today. <clears throat> um, so in a really roundabout way, Jesus answers, you know, what have you done? And Jesus' answer is, I'm here to testify to the truth. I'm here to, I'm here to, I'm here to share the truth. And the truth is about, you know, how things kind of stack up. And I think in this way, we find ourselves 
seeing Christ's vision of justice and truth. Here we see kind of this revelation of the nature of God's kingdom. And it prepares us, you know, here at the end of the church year for what's about to come next in Advent. That, that, that Jesus is going to be born into the manger and Jesus is going to rule at the end of time. And yet there's this in-between, right, period that we've been living in for 2,000 years and we might live in for another 2,000 years between something that has been promised, the, the love and presence of God in our midst, Jesus the Christ, the incarnate one, God with us. And yet, and yet, the continued agency and, and action uh, of the free will of human, humanity, that, that, we, that we still, like, like our Old Testament brothers and sisters, we still clamor for earthly kingship. Uh, we still clamor for, um, you know, we still clamor at some level uh, for, the, for, the, for the familiarity of the flesh pots in Egypt. And yet, and yet God is with us saying, but I've got, I've got kind of something better for you. I, I've got a life that is, that is truly free. I have a life that is lived in my love and in my truth that kind of puts an end to all of the other stuff that holds you back. So on this Christ the King Sunday, I'm going to be thinking a lot about my own priorities and about how I, um, how, how I exercise that agency, that free will that God has given me to trust and believe in a king who I might not be able to see and yet who gives far more life than anything any earthly king could give. And I'll put my trust in that. I'll put my trust in him who has come, you know, not in this world to take over this world, but has come into this world to reveal the truth of this world and to bring and to call um, all of those uh, who listen to him into that truth. So I hope, I hope you'll join me. We'll see. <clears throat> I think that's pretty good for now. Thank you. It's always great to be together. If you like this episode, give us a thumbs up. Subscribe to the podcast or the videos, wherever you get those, so that you never miss an episode. Share it with friends. It's always good to share. And, uh, and now we, and I hope you feel a little more prepared to hear these words. We'll see you soon.